And so they're walking. He's done it. And if they're walking, they're talking. Talking in a rather different way, no doubt. I've typed it out often enough about how differently particles behave when they're unobserved. I knew meals would never hold out if they could only get through the first few minutes. Pull me out of curiosity. Now they're gone. An hour will mean two, of course. Perhaps three. First thing they ever did was go for a walk together. In Göttingen, after that lecture, Niels immediately went out in search of the presumptuous young man who'd queried his mathematics and swept him off for a tramp in the countryside. Walk, talk, make his acquaintance. And when Heisenberg first came here to work for Niels, off they go on the great tour of Zealand. A lot of his century's physics they did in the open air. Strolling around the forest paths at his village, going down to the beach with the children, Heisenberg holding Christian's hand. Yes, and every evening after dinner in Copenhagen, they'd go for a walk around Follett Park behind the Institute or out along Langellini into the harbor. Walk and talk. Long, long before the walls had ears. But this time in 1941, their walk takes a different course. Scarcely ten minutes after they've gone and they're back, I barely have time to clear the table for dinner and there's meals in the doorway. I can see at once how upset he is. He won't look me in the eye. Heisenberg's come to say goodbye. He's leaving. He won't look at me either. Thank you. A delightful evening. Almost like old times. So kind. But you'll have some coffee before you go. A glass or something. I have to get back and prepare for my lecture. But you'll come and see us again. He has a great deal to do. It was like the worst moments of 1927 all over again. When Niels first came back from Norway and read Heisenberg's uncertainty paper, something they both seemed to have forgotten about earlier in the evening, although I hadn't. Perhaps they both now remember. Although from the looks on their faces, something worse has happened. Forgive me if I've done or said anything that... Yes. It meant a great deal to me, being here with you both again. More perhaps than you realize. It was our pleasure. Give our love to Elizabeth. <clears throat> of course. Children. Perhaps when this war is over, if we're all spared. Goodbye. Politics. Mm -hmm. Physics. But how can he be right? He can't possibly uh, be. A breath of air as we talk. A breath of air? Or a child in the garden. Healthy when they stay indoors, perhaps. Yes. Or everyone in love. Yes, thank you. He can't be right, though. John Wheeler and I went through the whole thing in 1939. What did he say? Well, nothing. I don't know. I was too angry to take it in. Something about fission. Well, what happens in fission? You fire a neutron at a uranium nucleus, and it splits and releases energy. A huge amount of energy, yes. About enough energy to move a speck of dust. But it also releases two or three more neutrons each of which has the chance of splitting two or three more nuclei. Which each release energy in their turn. And two or three more neutrons. You start a trickle of snow as you ski. That trickle becomes a snowball. An ever-widening chain of split nuclei forged through the uranium, doubling and quadrupling from millions of a second, from one generation to the next. First two splits, let's say for simplicity. Then two squared, two cubed, two to the fourth, two to the fifth, two to the sixth. Thunder of the gathering avalanche echoes through all the surrounding light. Until eventually, after, let's say, 80 generations, two to the 80th specks of dust have been moved. Two to the 80th is a number with 24 knots. About enough specks of dust to constitute a whole city and all who live in it. But there's a catch. Yes, there is a catch, thank God. See, naturally, uranium consists of two different isotopes, U-238 and U-235. Less than 1% of it is a 235, and this tiny fraction is the only part that's visionable by fast neutrons. This was Bohr's great insight, another of his fundamental intuitions. It came to him with Wheeler at Princeton walking across the campus. A characteristic Bohr moment. I wish I could have been there to enjoy it. Five minutes deep silence as they walked, then. Now hear this, I've understood everything. In fact, it's a double catch. See, the 238 is not only impossible to fission by fast neutrons, it also absorbs them. So very soon after the chain reaction starts, there aren't enough fast neutrons left to fission the 235. And the chain stops. Now, you can fission 235 with slow neutrons, but 
But then, but then the chain reaction occurs more slowly, and the uranium blows itself apart. Again, the chains. Well, what all this means is that an explosive chain reaction will never occur in natural uranium. To make an explosion, you would have to separate out 235. And to make the chain reaction long enough for a large explosion, 80 generations, let's say, you would need many tons of it. And it's extremely difficult to separate. Tantalizing. Mercifully difficult. The best estimates I came up with when I was in America in 1939 said to separate out just one gram of 235 would take 26,000 years, by which time this war will surely be over. <laughs> so he's wrong. He's wrong, you see. He's wrong. Or could I be wrong? Could I have miscalculated? Well, let me see. What, what's the mean free path of slow neutrons in 235? What's the absorption rate of fast neutrons in 238? But what exactly had Heisenberg said? That's what everyone wanted to know then and forever after. It's what the British wanted to know once Chadwick managed to get in touch with me. What exactly did Heisenberg say? And what did Bohr reply? That's what my colleagues wanted to know when I returned to Germany. What did Heisenberg say to Niels? What did Niels reply? The person who most wanted to know was Neil Heisenberg himself. You mean when he came back to Copenhagen after the war in 1947? Escorted this time not by unseen agents of the Gestapo, but by a very conspicuous minder from British intelligence. I think he wanted various things. Two things. Food parcels. For his family in Germany. They were on the verge of starvation. And for you both to agree what you'd said to each other that night. Conversation went wrong almost as quickly as it did before. You couldn't even agree where you walked. Where we walked, Fallen Park, of course. Where we went so often in the old days. But Fallen Park is behind the Institute, four kilometers from where we live. I can see the drift of autumn leaves beneath the street. Yes, the because you remember it as October. And it was September. No fallen leaves. And it was 1941, no street lamps. I thought we hadn't gotten any further than my study. What I can see is the drift of, of desk papers under the lamp. We must have been outside, because what I was going to say was treasonable. If I'd have been overheard, I'd have been executed. So what was this mysterious thing you said? There's no mystery about it. There never was any mystery. I remember it absolutely clearly, because my life was at stake. And I chose my words very carefully. I simply asked you if, as a physicist, does one have the moral right to work on the practical exploitation of atomic energy, yes? I don't recall. You don't recall, no, because you immediately became alarmed. I'm you stopped dead in your tracks. I was horrified. Horrified, good. You remember that. You stood there gazing at me, horrified. Because the implication was obvious that you were working on it. And you jumped to the conclusion that I was trying to provide Hitler with nuclear weapons. And you were. No, a reactor. That's what we were trying to build. A machine to produce power, to generate electricity, to drive ships. You didn't say anything about a reactor. I didn't say anything about anything. Not in so many words, I couldn't. I didn't know how much you'd repeat to others, how much could be overheard. Then I asked you if you actually thought that uranium fission could be used in the construction of weapons. Ah, uh, it's coming back. And I clearly remember what you replied. I said I now knew that it could be. This is what really horrified me. Because you always thought that weapons would need 235, and that we could never separate enough of it. A reactor, yes. Maybe. Because there, it's not going to blow itself apart. You can keep the chain reaction going with slow neutrons and natural uranium. What we'd realize, though, is once we could get the reactor running, the 238 would absorb all the fast neutrons. Exactly as you predicted in 1939. The 238 would absorb the fast neutrons and be transformed by them into a new element altogether. Neptunium. Which in its turn would decay into another new element. At least this fizz out the 235 we couldn't separate. Plutonium. Plutonium. I should have worked it out for myself. But by this point, you stopped listening. The bomb had already gone off inside your head. What we realized is that if we could build a reactor, we could build bombs. But I grasped the central point already. That one way or another, you saw the possibility of supplying Hitler with nuclear weapons. You grasped at least four different central points, all of them wrong. You told Rosenthal that I tried to pick your brains about free fission. You told Weisskopf that I tried to ask you about the Allied nuclear program. Chadwick thought I tried to convince you that there was no German program. But then you managed to tell some people that I tried to recruit you to work on it. No. Very well.
Let's start all over again from the beginning. No Gestapo lurking in the shadows, no British intelligence officer, no one watching us at all. Only me. Only Margaret. We're going to make this whole thing clear to Margaret. You know how strongly I believe that we don't do science for ourselves, that we do it to explain to others. In plain language. In plain language, yes. Not your view, I know. You'd be happy to explain what you were up to purely in differential equations, if you could. <laughs> but for Margaret's sake. Plain language. Plain language. All right. So here we are, walking, and I'm listening carefully. What is it you want to say? It's not just what I want to say, but the whole German nuclear team. Not Diebner, of course, not the Nazis, but Weizsäcker, Hahn, Wurz, Jensen's, Hudermanns. They all wanted me to come and discuss it with you. We see you as a sort of spiritual father. The Pope. That's what you used to call heels behind his back. And now you've come for absolution. Absolution, no. According to your colleague Jensen. The absolution is the last thing I want. You told one historian that Jensen expressed it perfectly. Is that why I've come? Absolution? It's like trying to remember who was at that lunch you gave me at the Institute. Around the table sit all the different explanations for everything I did. Rosenthal, Peterson, Moeller, and yes, now the word absolution is taking its place among the rest of them. Although I thought absolution was granted for sins past and repented, not sins intended and yet to be committed. Exactly, that's why I was so shocked. You were shocked. Because you did give me absolution. That's exactly what you gave me. As we're hurrying back to the house, you mutter something under your breath about how everyone in wartime feels obliged to do what's best for his country, yes? I don't know what I said. But now, here I am, profoundly calm and conscious. Conscious. Weighing my words. You don't want absolution. I understand. You want me to tell you not to do it? All right. I put my hand on your arm. I look you in the eye in my most papal way. <laughs> Go back to Germany, Heisenberg. Gather up your colleagues in the laboratory. Get up on a table and tell them that Niels Bohr says, in his most considered judgment, that supplying a homicidal maniac with improved methods of, of mass murder is, what shall I say, a rather interesting idea. <laughs> no, 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 not even an interesting idea. A really rather seriously uninteresting idea. What happens? You'll all fling down your Geiger counters? Obviously not. Because they'll arrest you. Whether they arrest us or not, it won't make any difference. In fact, it might make things worse. I run my program at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, but there's a rival one at the Army Ordinance run by Kurt Diebner, and he's a party member. If I go, they'll simply turn my program over to Diebner. He should be running it anyway. Burtz and the others simply smuggle me in to keep Diebner and the Nazis out of it. My one hope is to remain in control. So you don't want me to say yes, and you don't want me to say no. What I want is for you to listen to what I'm going on to say next. Instead of running off down the street like a map. Very well. Here I am, walking along the street slowly and popishly. And I listen as you tell me that nuclear weapons will require an enormous technical effort. True. That they will suck up huge resources. Huge resources, certainly. That at some point, governments will turn to scientists and ask whether it's worth committing those resources. Whether there's any hope of producing the bombs in time for them to be used. Of course, but... Wait! So then they'll have to come to you and me. We will be the ones who have to advise them whether to go forward or not. In the end, the decision will be in our hands whether we like it or not. This is what you want to tell me. This is what I want to tell you! This is why you've come all this way with so much difficulty. This is why you've thrown away nearly 20 years of friendship. Simply to tell me this. Simply to tell you that. Heisenberg, this is more mysterious than ever. What are you telling it me for? What am I supposed to do about it? The government of occupied Denmark isn't going to come to me and ask me whether we should produce nuclear weapons. No, but the government of Nazi Germany is going to come to me 
they're going to ask me whether to continue or not. I'll have to decide what to tell them. You have a very easy way out of your difficulties. You tell them exactly what you just told me. You tell them how difficult it will be. And perhaps they'll be discouraged. Perhaps they'll lose interest. But what will be the consequences if we manage to fail? What can I tell you that you can't tell yourself? There was a report in a Stockholm paper. The Americans are working on an atomic bomb. 